Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, creator of things seen and unseen, sustainer and provider of all things, Christ the Son, he who was made manifest in the flesh, who came down, who sacrificed himself, on the third day rose, having victory over sin and death, and now sits on the right hand of the Father. Eternal, begotten, Holy Son, to the Holy Spirit triune, the one that convicts us of sin, righteousness and judgment, who illumines all truths to his saints, the one that reveals and regenerates our souls, we pray that you be with us this evening, that your people would come to you in true worship, that we would be a people totally and wholly submitted unto you and your word. Father, we thank you for the grace that you show us, for your long-suffering, for your merciful. Lord, at times we can be a stiff-necked people. But your faithfulness, Lord God, continues and pursues us. Father, we ask and pray that the Holy Spirit would move amongst your people this evening, that the preaching of the word of God will grab the hearts of your people, that it would shake, stir, and roll us up unto holiness, that we would leave this place different to how we came. Lord God, allow us not to see a preacher behind the pulpit, but the words of God being preached. Allow us to submit ourselves to it sweetly and humbly with humility. We pray, Father, that this evening a work is done in this church. We pray that this evening, Lord God, you would wake us up to your truths, to accept your promises to live out the holy life that you have called us to live out. Father, for those that aren't saved, for those that have not been regenerated, that have not responded in faith and repentance, we pray that you lead them to do this, Lord God. We pray, Father, that we understand that there's sovereign appointment, Lord, and that no one is here by accident or mistake. We pray, Lord God, that you would bring some into the flock this evening, that you would change the hearts of many, Lord God, to draw them to faith and repentance in the finished work and person of Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord God, that we sing this evening honouring, glorifying and worshipping you truly in and through the Spirit. We pray, Father, that we sing a joyful sound that we don't do this in vain, but our words, Lord God, have meaning, and our hearts, souls, minds, and bodies are devoted to you as we sing, Lord God. Father, we pray and ask that you be with Brother Rob, Brother Leno, and Brother Anthony as they set out the plan for next year. We pray, Lord God, that you give them grace and wisdom. We pray, Father God, that you keep them faithful to you and your word that you guide and lead them, Lord God, and as they seek your face, they seek your purpose and your will for our church. And we ask as a church, Lord God, you teach us to humbly and sweetly submit unto those that you've put above us, that we would work with them, Lord God, and not against them. Father, we thank you once again for your honour and your grace and the ability to come to you in prayer and we pray, Father, that we use this gift more often, Lord God, and that as we pray and as we cast cares and burdens on one another, Lord God, that we grow in unity as a church, as a body of believers, Father. We grow in like-mindedness, in doctrine, theology, in purpose and work, and in our love for you. We pray, Father, that our love for one another displays the love that Christ has for his church. We ask all these things for your honour and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I'm...
evening. I um, usually when I'm invited here, uh, Pastor Rob tells me to try and stick to about 20, 25 minutes max. And I, I've, I think I've broken the rule twice, and, and he's invited me back, so I don't know. You know it's, I'm, I'm obviously doing something right, so that's striking. Me. I think you'll be pleased to know tonight. I, uh, I figured I've worked out the trick. I'm going to preach you half a sermon, and then I might make it in time. So I'm going to give you half a sermon today, and it's... Um, it's, it's from a series I started at my church uh, at, in, at uh, Guildford Baptist, and it's a series in the, to the Gospel of Mark. And so I figured I'd, uh, I'd give you an introduction into the Gospel of Mark uh, this evening. And, um, and I wanted to sort of get into expositing verses 1 to 8, but that will just take me way over. We might, might leave that for another time if there's another time. So uh, without further ado, let's bow our heads in prayer and let's, uh, we'll tackle sort of uh, some of the introduction of the Gospel of Mark together. Father, we love you, Lord. We thank you for your love and grace, Father. We thank you, Lord God, for uh, the abundant love that you showed us, Lord God, the love that you showed us reflected to us on the cross and your uh, incarnation, Father, and your obedience unto death, Lord God, and your resurrection, Father, that, that, uh, that obedience, Father, gave us eternal life, that gave us sonship, Father, that, that allows us, Father, to come before your throne of grace, Lord God, and to call you Abba Father, Lord. And what a privilege and what an honour that is, Father, that we can open up, Lord, your word, the written word that we might, it might reveal to us, the, the, the Logos, the written word, Father. And, and I just pray, Lord, that this evening, Lord, that you might settle our hearts and minds, that your Holy Spirit may fill this place and fill me, Father, and empty me myself, Father, that I might be a blessing to your people, to your church, Father, that may be encouraged uh, and renewed, Father, and that you may receive all glory, praise, and honour from this evening. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, the Gospel of Mark, it's, um, it's a very unique Gospel, in, in not just that it's the shortest one, probably the easiest and quickest to read, but it's, um, <clears throat> as you go through, through church history, uh, you know, Romans, sorry, Revelations, rather, 4-7, uh, gives, describes what we call sort of the cherubim around God, and it sort of describes sort of the, you know, the, the faces of the, the cherubim, and gives four descriptions. It describes the face of a lion, of a calf, of a man, and of an eagle. And through church tradition, I'm not exposing the passage, but through church tradition, and for those that sort of go through Europe and go through uh, Rob and some of the, his, his church tours and whatnot, you'll see um, basically these pictures and these faces of the, the cherub, and each one likened to one of the Gospels. And, uh, and according to church tradition, the, the Gospel that is most likened to the Gospel of Mark is the calf or the ox. And the reason for that is, is the Gospel of Mark betrays Jesus Christ as the working servant. As, as a servant who is busy and is the workman of God. And you know, much like an ox and a calf back in those days was, was a work animal, an animal that was used for labour. And, and, and it basically Mark gives us that picture, that sort of semblance of Christ. And, and for this reason, it's very much what we would consider a very busy gospel. You know, imagine if you were watching like a, a, almost a movie or a TV episode. It's got all these cut scenes. It cuts from one scene to another, to another, to another. And in fact, in the book of Mark, you find the word immediately occur more than 40 times throughout the you know, 16-odd chapters of, of the gospel. And that's, it just goes to show you, I mean, it says that, that Jesus is doing this, and immediately he does that, that immediately he does it, and he's just shifting gear, going from one scene to another, from one, one episode, one piece of activity to another. And you constantly see Christ busy working as the Messiah and in obedience to God. And this, this gospel of Mark is, is very much an emphasis on the deeds and works of Christ and a lot less on the words of Christ. You know, very much the servant king, the, you know, the servant at work. And we see that very much in the, the tradition of Mark. Now Mark, according to, to strong church tradition, and we'll deal with this a little bit later this evening, is, um, it's very much considered that he was... Uh, basically dictated to, or rather it's, it's considered in some respects the gospel of, of Peter, that Mark was basically sort of penned down what the apostle Peter had told him. And we see, for example, semblances of this in the epistle of Peter, where in 1 Peter 5.13, he refers to Mark, he says, Mark, my son. It refers to a sort of a, like almost a paternal relationship that he has with, with Mark between you know, him and Peter. But the fact remains that the gospel wasn't written by Peter, it was written by Mark. And it's called the Gospel of Mark. And so it's important for us, I think, to, make, to pause and not just discount the author and to consider who is Mark. Who was Mark that his name is pinned down in history? And so as we go through the New Testament, there's a couple of references, there's several references that pick up the name of Mark. 
and this, this character of Mark. And so I want to try and unpack that this evening to try and discover who this man was. And so he first appears onto the scene in, in, uh, in Acts chapter 12, verse 12. And this is sort of a, uh, <clears throat> an episode where Peter has been imprisoned, right? And, uh, and, and he's basically, he's got sort of this, this quadrant of soldiers where yeah, essentially yeah, a group of soldiers surrounded him in, in, in sort of a, uh, in episodes of sort of six hours at a time. So 24 hours, he, you know, Peter had, had sort of soldiers around him and he was chained up and whatnot. And as we know, the account, the story in Acts 12, and I won't go into it for time's sake, just to quickly paraphrase, you know, the angel of the Lord appeared to Peter and, and basically put the, you know, the Roman soldiers to sleep and somehow undid the chains and... And Peter gets up and he leaves. And where's he go? In verse 12, Acts 12, verse 12. And so when he had considered this, this is Peter, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many gathered together praying. So immediately when Peter was free, he goes to this, to Mary, the mother of John Mark. He goes straight to their home. And so there's this connection there. And the suggestion is that, that, that you know, the, the, the early church, as it was then, met regularly at John Mark's house. And it was a, a place that, that Peter knew, and Peter knew well. We all know the story. Uh, Peter came to the door, and they were there praying for him and whatnot. And they were all surprised. But then Mark appears on this scene again in verse 25 of the same chapter, where it tells us, and then Barnabas and Saul, so the, this is sort of the transition from Peter. Yeah, for Peter takes up almost the first half of the book of Acts, a little bit less than half. And the, the latter part of the book of Acts is pretty much all about sort of Paul and Paul's journeys. And this is part of the transition. So in verse 25, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, and when they had fulfilled their ministry, they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So Paul and Barnabas take this, this man, John Mark, who was, you know, obviously uh, had a relationship with Peter, they take him with them into their ministry, into their ministry out into you know, sort of you know, Turkey and Greece and to the Gentiles. And as we know, and we know through some of the passages, and we'll pick this up in a second, you know, Mark was also the cousin of, of, John, of Barnabas. And then we go to the next chapter in chapter 13 as, as Barnabas and Paul go, go out into their ministries and, and they, they basically immediately sort of face some, some uh, resistance. And as they come into sort of a, 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 the island of Paphos, in fact, we pick it up from sort of quickly from verse 6, uh, Acts 13, verse, verses from 5 to, 5 to 7, that is. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. So speaking of Paul and Barnabas, John being John, Mark, the, the author of the Gospel of Mark, uh, he was an assistant to them. And then verse 6, Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was the proconsul uh, Sergius Pallas, an intelligent man. The man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. And as the, as the account goes, basically Paul is giving the gospel to this proconsul who wants to hear the word of God. And this, this, this sorcerer, this magician, starts to oppose him. Doesn't want him to receive the gospel. And so, you know, Paul in, in, in frustration turns to him and says, Mate, you're going to be blind for a time. And immediately he's struck with blindness and he can't see. And you can imagine this episode. It's almost sort of this, this, this exercise of power, this spiritual warfare that's being undertaken between, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the, the armies of God and the armies of Satan for, for the soul of this man. And ultimately he comes to the gospel, receives Christ, according to the scriptures. But imagine with me, so, so this man, John Mark, goes out with Paul and Barnabas and he starts engaging and seeing almost physically the manifestation of the spiritual warfare taking place. And he sees the victory and the power of Christ over, over the kingdom of Satan. And what's he do? This is amazing. I want more of this. He turns around and runs. Verse 13, Now when Paul and his party set from Paphos, they came to Perger and Pamphylia and John, departing from them, Return to Jerusalem. Now, to give you context, when Paul and Barnabas were sent out and they took John Mark with them, they were sent out from Antioch. So the church that sent out John Mark and Paul and Barnabas was Antioch. John Mark does the runner. He sees his spiritual warfare. He's afraid. He turns around. He runs away. He doesn't even go back to his sending church. He goes back to Jerusalem. Not only does he flee Paul and Barnabas, he, flee, he can't even face the church that sent him out. This man was terrified. And that's the author of the Gospel of Mark. But it doesn't end there, thankfully. Because the story continues, right? A couple of years later, 
you know, he disappears from the scene and a couple of years later his name pops up again. This time amongst Paul and Barnabas again in Acts 15. We'll see, read from verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John, called Mark. But Paul insisted they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to to the work. And their contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. So something had happened in these two years that somehow Mark had somehow restored himself and, and Barnabas, his cousin, was prepared to give him another chance. But Paul was like, mate, once burnt, twice shy. I'm not, I'm not working with you again. You, know, you ran as soon as we had some resistance. As soon as you saw a spiritual battle take place, you did the runner. I can't trust you. His lack of trust was so strong that he caused Paul and Barnabas, these inseparable twins, to part ways. I mean, to give you context in the, the, the relationship of Paul and Barnabas, Paul was a man, in fact, Paul, who was Saul, was a man that persecuted the church. No one trusted him. No one wanted him in, in their church. They thought it was like an undercover agent coming in to find out who they were to kill them. It was because Barnabas vouched for him. It was Barnabas that brought him in. And these guys part ways because of John Mark. I don't know about you, but it's not really a positive story. He runs the first sign of trouble, then causes the, you know, sort of the, the great separation of, of you know, the, the greatest duo in the history of the world. And yet this man authors the gospel. But again, luckily, it doesn't end there. After this account, for about 10 years, Mark disappears from the scene. Paul undertakes his missionary journeys. <clears throat> and it's important to know that, that in, his, in Paul's missionary journeys, Paul was imprisoned twice. Correct me if I'm wrong, Rob. Twice. And his first imprisonment, he wrote three letters. He wrote the Epistle to the Ephesians, the Epistle to the Colossians, and Philemon. Three letters in his first imprisonment. And this is about 10 years later, 10 years after his part of, part of ways with Barnabas. And watch what he says in his epistle to the church of Colossians. Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instruction. If he comes to you, welcome him. In 10 years, something had happened that had restored Paul and Mark's relationship. In that 10 year period, Something had happened in John Mark's life such that he'd done a 180, and not only done a 180, but now Paul trusted him and was vouching for him. Paul was doing for him what Barnabas did for Paul. In Philemon, in Philemon 1, 23 and 24, Paul writes, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. Mark was now a fellow labourer with Paul, hand in hand in the ministry. And you think to yourself, okay, well, that's great. But this guy, I mean, if you look at his history, he's a little bit up and down, right? How long does this relationship last with Paul? I mean, sure, he's made amends with Paul, but if judging by his, his, his record, he'll make amends one day and then just do the run of the next. Well, in Paul's second imprisonment, he writes a couple of letters, First and Second Timothy, last books he writes before he dies. In fact, Paul, writing Second Timothy, knows that he's about to die. In fact, he says it in Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul writes his last letter, Second Timothy, knowing he's about to die. You know, when you come to the end... You kind of want to be surrounded with those that you love, right? With those that you trust. And Paul's life was all in the ministry. He wanted those that could help him in the ministry. Watch what he writes from verse 9 to 11. He's writing, Paul here is writing to Timothy and he says, Be diligent to to come to me quickly. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, (laughs) 
Only Luke is with me. Watch what he says. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Mark had maintained that relationship with Paul, such that when Paul is about to die in his last letter, he asks for Mark to come to him. He asks for Timothy, please bring Mark with you. I need him for my ministry. What a testimony. His relationship with Paul was restored at the end. And we see that as we go through the epistles. And you think to yourself, well, how? How does that happen? How does someone go from being absolutely terrified of of any kind of spiritual conflict, terrified of any conflict to do with the gospel, who ran away not only from Paul and Barnabas, but ran away from his sending church. The man who caused a rift between the, the dynamic duo of Barnabas and Paul to becoming Paul's crutch in ministry. How do you go from that to that? I dare say it was the influence of Peter. Now Peter says in 1 Peter 5.13, She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. You see, I think like Mark, Peter knew what it was to be a failure. He knew what it was to reject Christ. But equally, Peter knew what it was to be restored in Christ. And that sonship relationship that he, he, he talks about between him and Mark, you see that personified in Mark's life. How it's translated and he changed the man from who he was to the crutch of Paul the Apostle, to the author of the Gospel, whose name has gone down in history. You know, as we... <clears throat> The ancient writers all agree that it was very much the influence of Peter that that influenced the writing of the gospel. In fact, you'll see someone like Polycarp, who's uh, one of the early church fathers who knew John, knew John the, the, the apostle, that is, the disciple of Christ. He had a student named Papias who wrote and says this, it is Mark, who was an interpreter of Peter, wrote with exactness. You know, you have people like Justin, who lived from 100 to 150 In his famous dialogue with Trypho, he speaks of the memoirs of Peter being the gospel of Mark. And he says, Mark wrote in Rome after Peter's death. To give you the context, this is sort of, you know, Peter dies after sort of the persecution of Nero and sort of Nero turning against the Christians and the the great fire of Rome and whatnot. And after Peter dies, Mark stays in Rome and he writes this, this, this gospel of Mark. And you've got others, you've got Irenaeus in 200 AD, Origen in 230, Clement in 300, Eusebius in 362. They all tell the same thing, that Mark authored what Peter said. In fact, Eusebius goes on and he he writes this, I want to quote this for those that like their church history. He says, "So, So great a light of religion shone upon the minds of the hearers of Peter that they were not satisfied with a single hearing or with the unwritten teaching of the divine proclamation, But with all kinds of entreaties urged Mark, whose gospel is extent, seeing that he was a follower of Peter, to leave them in writing a record of the teaching transmitted to them orally. Nor did they cease until they had prevailed upon the man, so that they became responsible humanly for the scripture that is called the gospel according to Mark. Another indication of Peter's influence over the gospel of Mark is the vivid detail that the Gospel of Mark contains that is, that's not pictured in any of the other Gospels. And yet you see things, for example, in, in <clears throat> a description of the, the green grass and the flowers in, in Mark, th- Mark 6.39. You see specifically the 2,000 hogs, the specific number that's referred to in Mark 5.13. You see that looking around, as far as Christ looking around before he spoke in, in Mark 3.5 and Mark 3.34. Very specific detail of someone who was present, who paid attention to Christ and his movements and to the surrounding environment. 
And another indication of Peter's influence is that, you know, the fact that Peter often spoke in, in Aramaic. And we see that he has more Aramaic phrases than, than, some, than any other Gospels. Words like monogis in, in, uh, in Mark 3.7, in Talitha Kumi in Mark 5.41, Corbin in Mark 7.11. I'm not going to try to pronounce it in the next one in Mark 7.34. You guys can look it up here yourself. Abba in Mark 4.36. And some would go and argue that, that Mark's gospel was one of the, there's the first gospel written, and there's some you know, sort of contest, contest about that, but it was certainly one of the very early gospels, the very early books that was written. <clears throat> but it very much pictures Christ as a working servant, which is somewhat consistent with Peter, at the end of Peter's ministry, he was very much ministering in Rome. And it's said, according to church history, that Mark penned his gospel in Rome. And so it would make sense that the people that he would consider his authorship to would be Romans. And Romans were very much known for their diligent and hard work. Which makes sense why you see that this hard-working saviour, this labouring servant, with the action-orientated gospel. <clears throat> And in fact, you see that Mark, more than any other of the gospel writers, uses more Latin words than any others. Words like centurio in, in Mark 15.39, quadrans in Mark 12.42, praetorium in Mark 15.16, speculator, sextarius and others, all through, littered throughout the gospel of Mark. <clears throat> and believe it or not, this, actually, this fact surprised me. The gospel of Mark is actually the most translated gospel in any other language than any of the other four gospels. I thought it would be John. But it's the actual the gospel of Mark. And you might think, well, I kind of get it because it's the shortest gospel, right? Less to write, less effort. It's actually not. And the reason that it's, 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 a, it's the most translated is because it was written very much for a Roman audience that were unfamiliar with Jewish customs. They didn't need to, you didn't need to have all the context and understanding all the Jewish customs and their ways to appreciate who Christ was when you read the Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> and we see this, this man, Mark, is known and, and I suppose cemented in history because of his authorship of one of the four Gospels of Christ. And yet when you look at his life, it wasn't the life of a superhero wasn't a life of this perfect Christian that never did wrong. wasn't the life of a man that never fouled and or never fled. Quite the contrary. See, Mark gives us, and I love the way he starts, you know, he starts at the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He gives us a, a practical, personified example of what the gospel is, of what grace is. Yeah, you know, we think of grace and we think of grace for salvation. Yes, grace does save but grace also sanctifies. Grace changes. Grace molds and makes us into the image and likeness of Christ. You know, friends, when we get saved, imagine you get this sort of this present, this box that you open up and you get salvation out of. But the truth is, when we look at the Christian life and the Christian walk, when we, when we come through hard times and struggles, you know what we're meant to do? Reach into that same box that we got salvation to get grace to endure. When I want to become sanctified and become more like Christ, to be empowered and be encouraged to share the gospel to strangers, you know what I should do? Go to that same box to get that same grace to change me and make me, give me the boldness that I need to proclaim the gospel of Christ. It's why most of the epistles and say, grace and peace be multiplied unto you. He's talking to Christians, he's talking to saints, and yet he's still saying, grace be multiplied. He doesn't want them to get saved again. They're already saved, but he's saying that grace multiplied to change you, that grace upon grace that changes us and makes us more like Christ. We see that personified in the life of Mark. And that's why he wrote the gospel of Mark. That's why his name goes down in history. And can I say, brothers, sisters, if you would let that same grace work in your life, to mould you, to make you, to change you, to become like Christ. 
You'll, you'll change from someone that runs from spiritual warfare and conflict to someone who becomes a crutch for Paul the Apostle and authors the gospel. That only comes through growing in grace and letting grace abound in our lives. And Mark is a testimony to that gospel of Christ. And it's not just sufficient for salvation, but for sanctification in and through our lives. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we love you, Lord. And we thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for your gospel, Lord. We thank you that this gospel, Lord, is not just sufficient to save us. And it does save, Lord. It saves to the uttermost, Father. But that same grace, Father, that you give us, that same gospel is the gospel to, to change us, to mould us, to make us, to sanctify us, Lord God, to make us more like Christ. And I pray that each and every man and woman in this room, Father, that you might work, your Holy Spirit may work in their lives, Father. They may let the grace abound, Lord God. And they may grow in your grace, Father. They may be, become more like you. And, and we might take the lesson of, of Mark, Father, and to turn our lives, Lord God, that we might become people that would become a crutch to Paul the Apostle, Father. That we might be beneficial to, to you and to others, Lord God, to the ministry, Father. I pray this for every person here in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Brother Maroon, for that message. And um, it's sobering to see the change that we see in Mark's life and understanding that that change was done and made through God. So just with that, um, before we are dismissed...
just a few announcements. As always, God continues to provide, bless, give, share bread with us. So please, let's not leave it downstairs. Let's take it home. Let's take it to our neighbours, our friends, our family. Use it to share the gospel. <laughs> Figure something out. Um, but please, let's, let's use what God has blessed us with. Also, um, there's gardening on tomorrow at, at 10 a.m. So if anyone wants to come to church and help Brother Martin out with that, um, there, I know I think there are a couple of men will be here so if you will come tomorrow at 10 a.m. and also brother Steve Mr. Kidis is going to go tracking tomorrow as well also at 10 a.m. meet here um, so if you want to go tracking or if you want to help with the gardening please see either brother Martin or brother Steve amen all right God bless thank you